I'd like to start by thanking the Animal Behavior Management Alliance for asking me to be a part of this second Behavior Month. And I'm very excited to be sharing some information that has been very helpful to me in my animal training. And I hope it will be helpful to you. It's just going to be a little taste, a little sneak peek. But um, if we're lucky, maybe some more of this information will be shared at the upcoming annual conference. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to be talking about advanced advances in animal training that are improving welfare. And my name is Barbara Heidenreich, and uh, you can find me at animaltrainingfundamentals.com. So let's go ahead and get started. We've certainly come a long way in the things that we're doing in the world of animal training, but for me, I guess the journey is never over, and it certainly isn't over yet. We currently are on the cusp of some really exciting changes that I think are really um, set to dramatically improve animal welfare. And I think it's really thrilling to be an animal trainer right now because all these changes are, there's just so many of them right now that are kind of happening right at the same time. And uh, what I'd like to do with this presentation is really look at kind of where we've been and hopefully the potential of where we could go. And I'll hopefully share some video examples that will be inspiring to you and, uh, and we'll take it from there. So let's take a look at some of these welfare benefits of animal training that are likely quite familiar to many of you that are watching this presentation. Certainly, we've learned a lot about training animals to cooperate in medical care. We've also learned about training animals to participate in day-to-day -day care. We've learned a lot about addressing undesired responses, but I think we've got a lot of potential for, for more growth in this area. We've learned about creating enriching experiences, um, also data collection for scientific studies. So we learn a lot about our, our learners. And uh, I've been really fortunate to participate in um, some conservation initiatives that have been really rewarding experiences for me and hopefully for you as well. So um, those of you that have been fortunate to participate in those kinds of experiences. So we'll look at a few examples just to get us started here. Uh, this is one, I, this is where I get to kind of, you know, brag on my, my clients a little bit. Uh, this is um, some injection training. I'm going to lower the volume here a little bit. This is some injection training with a lemur that does need daily insulin injections. And um, this is from Santa Ana Zoo. And I'll just go ahead and play this video. I think some nice things to point out here is that you'll see that... Uh, Part of the group is just uh, asked to stay over in one section of the enclosure while she will separate. But of course, she can always go back to the group if she would like to. And one of the things that I really love is this chute that they've made so that it makes it a little bit easier for access to different body parts to get her daily insulin injection. And she's also trained to go into a crate where she is transported to the veterinary clinic uh, to go into an induction box. Um, the crate fits into an induction box where she uh, is lightly sedated for blood sampling to check her glucose levels. So that's another thing this team has also done. Oh, and this is a, this one doesn't have audio, so I'll go ahead and let it play. Um, this is um, at the University of Gießen. This is Elisa Voost, who's a veterinarian there. And uh, we did some workshops there some years ago. And I wanted to share this one because although this animal you'll see is getting fed throughout the procedure, this is a jugular blood draw on an African gray, 
the reason I wanted to share this one is because this was only the second time she had ever done this with this parrot. So this is a companion parrot that had been brought into their clinic due to, you know, an, an illness. I, I don't remember exactly what the illness was going on, what was going on there, but they needed to sample, take blood samples. But one of the things that this veterinarian had noticed is that this particular individual animal um, was quite distressed by restraint, but it was willing to take food at the veterinary clinic. And so they decided a better option was to see if they could do a blood sampling procedure this way, as opposed to using restraint, which is, as many people know, kind of a, a common procedure for taking them a blood sample. And so just because of this veterinarian's background of having had some exposure to training, um, it, this occurred to her as an option and so as a, as a less stressful option for collecting blood on this particular patient. And this ended up being a patient in which blood sampling had to be done on a, a, re, a relatively regular basis. And so they were able to do this repeatedly with this particular individual. All right, so let's look at some more examples. So this was some of the work that um, uh, we got to do via the Oregon Zoo, working with the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation. And some of the animals there, um, you know, because they have so many animals that have come in from the wild that um, need either medical treatment or they were orphaned and they're being um, rehabilitated and re released back into the wild eventually through this very elaborate process that they have there. Some of them are, they, they just ha don't have a lot of space to keep all the animals. And so some of them are in enclosures in which they can't be shifted out of the enclosure in order for someone to clean or put enrichment in. And so one of the things that we, um, talked about training with some of these animals was just a, a simple trade procedure or behavior so that enrichment could be put in the enclosures and then the debris could the animals could trade could give the debris back to somebody uh, you know a keeper or somebody so that the animals could be offered more enrichment items that could actually be placed inside the enclosure as opposed to only hung on the outside so this is working with one of the staff members there one of the veterinarians actually to teach a trade behavior which we actually did in just the one training session so you're going to see we're using a stick because we don't care if the animal keeps the stick and then we even get to the point of of trying to put the behavior under stimulus control using a, a cue to train um, to teach the animal to give the the stick back when we give the cue. So I'll let you watch this behavior. Okay, I have it. <laughs> so he Oh, uh, that that's good. good. I'm going to give him extra for that. Even though he didn't do it intentionally, mm -hmm. it still, we got the right result. Just can give him an idea. Food, so maybe he'll figure it out. Yes. Yes. I'd take it. Yeah, I'd take it because it's a step. Okay. Yeah, because he is having a hard time. But I think you're close. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good to see him. Yeah. Take it in. Yes! <laughs> Yay! <Yeah>. That's great. <laughs> so cool. Yes. That's so cool. Awesome. <laughs> it's great when that moment happens, isn't it? Yeah. When they understand, when you help them understand. <laughs> Good with the cue too. Perfect. There you go. He's trying. That was perfect. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. You got it. You got it. I can't believe I'm doing this. I have no idea. I have no idea. Love how he says, I can't believe I'm doing this. I think it's because it happened so fast, you know, he was able to train the behavior so fast. So it's pretty cool, just in one session. And also addressing undesired responses. And some of you may recall, I, I did a presentation on this behavior in the past. Um, this is Sirocco the Kakapo in uh, New Zealand, so a rare flightless 
parrot, a nocturnal parrot, and you'll see the undesired response in the beginning of this video in which the bird is trying to um, mate basically with people's heads. And we, um, and you'll, you'll see our solution in here um, in the process as well, in which we basically uh, changed that we, we, uh, we redirected the behavior to um, a different object. And so when we would see the precursors for the sexual behavior, we would ask him to do a different behavior and then we'd reinforce that with the opportunity to mate with the, uh, the different object. So I'll let you watch this video. So there you're seeing the undesired response. You can see it can be quite aggressive about trying to get to people's heads. So we did teach him to do some simple behaviors like targeting, um, also stationing. This is a stump. And, and we are literally training him out in the middle of nowhere on an island that he can roam around. And this is our, our new object. <laughs> and I'll explain why the object in a moment. Target? <laughs> right, that's good. That's good. Wow. Not so bad. Like, are you going to redirect me? <laughs> Would that normally have been a stimulus for him to want to do something? Oh, hell yeah. yeah. yeah so, uh, and the reason we chose the shoe is. Um, because he had a, a reputation for stealing these croc shoes off of the porches of the rangers' houses, because um, like I said, he's roaming around on an island. And the, the reason we believe that might have happened is that he was a hand-raised chick due to a respiratory illness when he was young. And remember I said these are ground-dwelling parrots, they're flightless nocturnal parrots. And so when the rangers would go in to hand feed them, they would change into these croc shoes for basically for cleanliness purposes. And so we believe that those croc shoes were very highly um, associated with hand feeding formula. So that's that's probably where that uh, association happened there. Um, there's a whole paper on that. So um, if you want that, you know, just let me know and I can direct you where you can read more about that. All right, so we also train for um, enrichment purposes, and uh, and I'm sure many of you have lots of examples of that within your facilities. I thought I'd share one with my companion rabbit. Um, I trained her to do a scent discrimination, and uh, one of these balls smells like banana flavored extract, and uh, so she's picking out the one that smells like the extract, and she, she um, you know, you'll see was always very eager to train. <laughs> and, and I think some of these ones that were more about um, solving a problem were, were often a little bit more fun than, than just doing, you know, a turnaround or um, a retrieve type thing. So, so uh, she was quite good at that. Wish they lived longer though, unfortunately don't live forever. <laughs> but yeah, it's pretty fun. He's pretty good at it. <laughs> All right. So here's another one working with the conservation project. And um, this is a, one of the orangutans that was orphaned. And so they have quite a few young orangutans. I think at the time we were there, they had around 200 that they were trying to rehabilitate and, and um, release to these pre-release islands. And then they go to protected land um, in Borneo. And this one's named Luti. And the challenge with Luti is she often would leave the forest early. So they take the babies out into the forest in the daytime and they spend the day out in the forest with um, caregivers who teach them very um, different, various survival skills. And then at night they come back to a kind of a compound where they all stay at night. And she kept returning Hi. early. So we were working on teaching oh, her to stay job, out of the forest. <laughs> now this is yeah. not Luti. <laughs> this is a different orangutan, but this is just to show you what a release to a pre-release island looks like. You can see a 
<laughs> Good girl, Mia. She's so happy right there. Say thanks for the food. <laughs> but this is Luti. Uh, we went to visit her a year later, and so she is on one of the pre release islands, and they do supplemental feedings at the pre release islands, and so this gives them an opportunity to kind of check on the individuals. Um, but otherwise, they are. They are out there on the islands, and you'll see when we pull back here just how big those pre-release islands are. So it was a really, uh, you know, wonderful opportunities to participate, you, you know, use the expertise we have with um, behavior change procedures to facilitate. And like I said, because of the work we did in helping Luti learn that there's value in staying out in the forest. Um, we were basically trying to create sort of an intermittent schedule of reinforcement for staying out in the, in the forest longer. It, it creates an opportunity for her to spend, to, to stay, spend more time out there, learn the skills she needs to learn so that she could have the opportunity to go to a pre-release island. And, and it furthers the opportunity for her to um, you know, continue that journey of getting back out into the wild rather than perhaps spending the rest of her life in an enclosure, um, which is certainly not the objective for the folks at Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation. So those are some of the, the really uh, cool things that we get to do with the, the knowledge that we have about, um, uh, about changing behavior. So I also wanted to talk about some of the things that we as people who practice um, application um, have really fine-tuned over the years, uh, which I think is really pretty uh, pretty valuable. I mean, I think you know, again, as animal trainers, we are we are practicing um, behavior change procedures on a regular basis. So, and so because of that, I think there are things that we do really well. And some of those things are is, is shaping with very small approximations. We've we've learned the value of that, um, many of us. And um, and a lot of times we develop extremely creative shaping plans that help us achieve our goals. And I find that a lot of us tend to use little prompting, or and if we do, we tend to fade those prompts um, very quickly. And, um, and really good trainers are really attentive to animal, animal body language. It, 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 it's how we collect information. <laughs> our, our organisms tend not to um, speak with us with verbal language to let us know what's, what's working for them and what's not. Um, and we're often really attentive to how our own behavior impacts animal behavior because our mistakes can be really cost, costly, right? Because some of the animals we work with are, are potentially dangerous. Um, and if we, and also if we make um, an error, it can create very large setbacks in our training. So if we create a fear response or aggressive behavior, then we, we really find ourselves in situations where we're, we're sort of having to retrain behaviors or, or figuring out new strategies. So it can be really difficult. So I have a fun video here to share of some toad training we, we did at Memphis Zoo, where you can see we're really figuring out the process of how to get started with this um, uh, toad with, with target training. And, and we really did do some really um, good problem solving to get the, this started. And so I'll let you watch that. So he kind of like walks along <laughs> or just sort of like, like it just drags along, you know what I mean? Yeah, there, there you go. Oh, yes. Good job. And then you could just let that cricket go. Yep, there you go. Perfect. Maybe. There you go. Good. Perfect. He could have already seen you. See if he might move a little bit more. There we go. Great. That's a little extra movement. Nice one. Good one. So it's a little deceptive, but there are a lot of details that went into that <laughs> in that video to get get that toad started. So he kind of 
So what else do we do? We thoughtfully arrange conditions to occasion behavior. So what does that mean? That, that means that we're, we're really paying attention to our antecedent architecture. And so an example I think about is like if we're working on hand injections, we pay a lot of attention to maybe the gauge of the needle that we're going to select if we're, and if we're going to use a numbing cream or if we're, we need to address the odor of antiseptics or if we might use overshadowing so the animal doesn't pay attention to the needle insertion or if, you know, if a butterfly needle is going to be involved. Um, all those little tiny details really make a difference on, on whether that animal is going to react or not. So those kinds of things are very important to us. Um, we implement strategies to reduce or um, eliminate latency. So a lot of people have worked on trying to train um, emergency recalls. And that latency is something that really would impact the effectiveness of emergency recall. And of course, this is very common for, for um, many animal trainers. But when you think about it, um, that it's a pretty big deal. A lot of us establish behaviors with barriers and we establish a lot of behaviors with barriers. And, and uh, you know, when you compare that maybe to a human learner, that's a, that's a really big deal <laughs> when, when you start to evaluate how many behaviors we do establish with, be, with barriers. And, and if you add on to that, we are now also really moving towards establishing a lot of behaviors without even touching the animal. So, um, you know, I come from a background where, there was still a lot of touching and a lot of um, mechanics of delivering reinforcers from your hands, which, you know, gives you a lot of precision. And so now that we're, we're adding more utensils to deliver reinforcers, that adds in an extra kind of mechanics to try and work out. And that can be a little bit challenging to get some precision when you're doing that. But it's not impossible, right? It's certainly not impossible. Um, but again, that just adds a, a different kind of mechanics into there that, um, but, but again, we're, we're accomplishing it. Um, and, it, and again, uh, establishing all of this with no common verbal language. And when you think about, you know, here we are using our verbal language to communicate human to human as to what we want people to do. And, and then think about all the things that we've accomplished with animals without this shared verbal language. It's pretty amazing. So some other things we do, we intensely study the ethology and phylogeny of our learners. So the, what does that mean? We're, we're studying the organism that we're starting with so that we know you know, what are they physically capable of at first? What are, what are you know, things that they, they might, might, you know, prefer? Like what are, you know, if we're going to use tactile as a reinforcer, what are body parts that, you know, tend to be more, um, they like having touched a little bit more than others and things like that. So we, we think about those things. And, um, and boy, you know, animal care professionals are, are really, you know, in my, in, in my experience, they are, really the experts at that. You know, when I'm consulting, I'm working alongside usually a person who's an expert at that species. And so I learned so much from that person, um, hopefully, and, and hopefully I'm sharing information with them about behavior change procedures. But, but you know, it's, it's cr pretty incredible the knowledge that um, the people in our industry have about their learners. Um, and we establish behaviors with such a wide variety of species. And I don't know if you can tell from the slide, but this is an open mouth behavior with a white rhino, with a Bactrian camel, with a dog, with a bear. You know, we, we really take it across all sorts of taxonomic groups. Um, and we often get behavior change really fast without the reliance on coercion. And I think that's one of the things that sometimes... Um, people don't realize is possible. They sometimes think that it needs to take a long time. But again, as a consultant, I'm, I'm usually at facilities for just a few days. And so, and often I'm only with one person or one animal for an hour. And so we try to get as much done as, as fast as we can. And again, we're not using coercion and we, we often can get a lot done really fast. And I like to think of us as the pioneers of what is possible. So many behavior ideas originated in the zoo community and spread amongst taxonomic groups. So I think that's another thing that's really, um, you know, kind of cool about those of us that work under these conditions in which we, um, you know, we have 
we have environments in which we need to work with barriers and protected contact and maybe without touching animals and we just get creative and you know look at what, what we um, are able to accomplish when we just say okay well those are the situations so let's just do what we can with our situation and so we find that we, we make some really cool things happen anyway so um, so again, I'm just going to share some, uh, you know, kind of based on what we just talked about there, some of the cool things that have been accomplished. Um, and again, I get to kind of share some of uh, some of the favorite, my favorite people that I've worked with over the years and some of the cool things that they've done. It's funny now when you talk about giraffes, you know, people are, are training giraffes all over the place, which is fantastic. And but, you know, I'm one of those old people that remember when nobody thought giraffes could do anything. Um, and uh, and this team that I worked with and still work with uh, many years ago they were they were really one of you know one of those few facilities that was training giraffes early on but they just didn't talk about it very much this is before zoos were posting much on social media and um so uh so you know back then i remember one of the um, people i was working with said why don't we train giraffes like elephants why can't they back up on cue why can't they swing their hips to the side to the on, on cue and i said why not? Let's do it. <laughs> and so I'm so glad. I remember being so happy when they said that. And so here's a little video example of um, of uh, one of their giraffes doing just that. And he's now 16 years old, so he's getting to be an old man. But uh, here's him in his, some of his younger days and, and a recent video, too, actually. Um, but this is before they they remodeled their facility. And he was so big, we couldn't even do this in the tamer that they had at that time. And um, and so he learned to back up and he learned to swing his hips to the side on cue and we had to, I think they still use this, um, this decorative straw bale <laughs> because it's just a good size. And, um, and they, you know, all the giraffes there voluntarily curl. They don't, they don't need to have, you know, they're very aware of their feet. They don't need to have it positions for themselves they, they they do it very well on their own and i remember us shaping those you know in just minutes on some of them you know on some of the herd where we would just um and we have you know some good strategies for for how to do that um but this is their newer facility and um and and here we were doing some stuff for the back back hooves and he's still Still, I, I and I have video. I think when he was first learning how to swing his hips in. Okay. So yeah, so it's it's it's. I mean, it's great to see everybody. You know, continuing to to see these guys as uh, as capable of doing so much more because they certainly are. So it's awesome. All right. So that was Santa Barbara Zoo, by the way. I, should, I forgot to mention who who was doing all that cool stuff. Uh, and then uh, and then this one is um, pretty fun. Um, I, I you know I, I came up with this strategy. Um, I guess it was early in the pandemic when we were all kind of stuck, and I was just looking for fun things to do. And um, and uh, and it was really fun to kind of see that people saw this and like took and took off with the idea. And so I've seen a bunch of people um, also um, model this setup that I have here and then do it with some other species, which is, which is, uh, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's cool to see that people are inspired. But, um, but what this was is this, this um, apparatus was actually a parrot perch I've had in my house for years. And all I did was modify it um, a little bit um, to do an open mouth with my dog. And the reason that I did it was in part, um, you know, just to train open mouth, but I was mostly doing it because we, um, I was thinking it was COVID related. I was thinking about um, training animals to uh, swab for COVID. And, uh, and that's really what inspired it all. And then, um, and then other people, um, you know, saw the idea and, and started um, utilizing it as well. So, so um, what you're going to see in this video is just a little clip of me doing it with my dog. And then, um, 
And then I had been talking with um, Annetta Peterson from Copenhagen Zoo, and she was saying how they needed to do a gum swab on their panda for a scientific study. And so they um, followed the shaping plan that I share, I shared, you know, how I trained it with my dog. And so they used the same shaping plan to train their panda. So you'll, you'll see the steps of the shaping plan um, in the second half of the video. So I'll show you my dog and then you'll see the, the shaping plan with the panda. And so here you're seeing that I'm putting like a, a syringe in my dog's nose because I also wanted to good job, show, you know, it's a, so it's a good. good setup for other behaviors, so not just like for brushing teeth or so things good. like that. Yeah. So with my dog, just like they're doing with the panda, my dog, you know, would bite a stick easily. So I started with a stick, just, just, you know, bite on a stick and I'll reinforce that. And then I turned it into bite two sticks. And that's what you'll see they'll do with the panda too. But my, my two sticks will were not taped together. <laughs> Theirs are taped together here. There we go. And then um, I changed my two sticks to two PVC pipes that were close together. And mine were bolted together with uh, bolts that had nuts on them so that I could change the distance. And then I mounted mine on the, on the perch, the parrot perch. And there you go, they got their swab. All right, so um, so this is kind of talking about creative shaping plans. So that's that was the point of sharing this, and then I'm going to show you another creative shaping plan. But first, I'm, I'm just going to show you the behavior, and then I'll talk about the creative shaping plan. This is at Santa Barbara Zoo. Okay, so I, I love this um, uh, shaping plan, and uh, I know these guys have said that I helped them with it, but I really think it was all them. <laughs> I remember having the Zoom conversation, but I, I really feel like they were just talking out loud, not loud and I was just nodding my head. But um, the way that they, they did this was literally through one repetition a day. And, uh, and I think it took them about two weeks and they had the behavior. So, um, so the leopard already knew its bridging stimul stimulus. And so think of the bridging stimulus at, in this case as a, um, as a cue, right? So when it hears the whistle, it means come back to the trainer and you get, you get your food. Um, and so it already knew that behavior. And um, every time, any time that Wyatt was out on display, they could um, do things in the back area, right? So that, you know, animals out on display. So what they would do is they would make a chalk circle on the wall. And, um, and they, I guess they put a little bit of a, a, like a little bit of meat juice on the chalk circle as well. And so when the cat would come inside, it would notice there's a new stimulus in the environment. And so it would go check that out. And of course it smelled a little bit too. And so when it would go over, check out this new stimulus and um, put its nose on it, they could bridge and the animal, you know, would come over and get food. So, so it's bridged and reinforced for, for um, checking out the chalk circle. And so then the next time it's out on display, the next morning, they can, um, erase that chalk circle, put it someplace else. And they can also start um, introducing the laser onto that chalk circle. And then every time they do another repetition, they can make the chalk circle smaller. They can start considering eliminating the, the meat smell because now we're building up reinforcement history. And eventually the, the chalk circle can be eliminated and it's just the laser. And so that's how they did that um, over the course of one repetition a day over about two weeks. So pretty cool shaping plan.
All right. Uh, all right. So let's talk a little bit about training for injections. Uh, so again, this is at Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation, and this is uh, Scott from or Oregon Zoo. And the reason I wanted to share this video is because, uh, again, I, I kind of want to go back to this thing about, you know, training has to take a long time, and it doesn't necessarily. This was just in one training session. I just want to want you to see how quickly. Uh, a syringe is introduced to the arm of this orangutan who has a history of injections being aversive because um, in the past, what people would do is kind of sneak up and, you know, give a little, little poke and it's all over. Um, but, you know, the animals would learn to move away from people trying to sneak up with them, uh, sneak up on them with uh, syringes. So they're very aware of what a syringe is. And so this is just the first session, um, but there were two sessions. And by the end of the second session, um, he, this animal was, was holding very calmly for being poked with a dull needle. And, uh, and so it's a little bit of a longer video, but I'm just going to let you watch, watch this and uh, listen to the conversation. You're also going to hear us talking a little bit about, about reinforcing the other animal over here. They do have a lot of male orangutans there and they're in close proximity to each other. And if you are not familiar with um, orangutans, they're generally relatively solitary, especially the males. So having two males close to each other is, is challenging. And especially, you know, one having to watch another one get good stuff that he may want. So, um, so that's kind of the setup and I'll just let you watch this. Okay, so you can go ahead and give him something for start sitting here. Okay. There you go. So, so Scott's touching while he's giving food or juice, but he's having to reach through. And what we want the orangutan to learn is to push against the mesh. But for now, he's having to reach through. Mm. Working. So this is very good with what's happening now. Mm -hmm. Now this one is going, okay, if I stay here, I get more juice. Mm -hmm. it's, it's even better if I stay close. And so he's pairing the juice with the moment he's touching. He's not going to be happy without Good. Yes. Yeah. So we have to make it more. Oh, is it just water? Can be? I don't know. Or <laughs> something. It has to be easy to I'm more nervous about that. Okay, so he, Scott said she just got, he got nervous as the syringe came a little bit closer. Okay. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to reinforce him. Not, not asking for the next step. Yeah. Telling us that he would, juice would be good. That this is hard for him to just tolerate what's all that's going on here. Yeah, and it could be that we're standing here, it could be that this animal's getting juice and he's not. So, for whatever reason. Oh, he touched. Did he touch? Oh, he sure did. He sure did. So a good thing to do for Karen is to reinforce him for being calm while this is going on and while we're standing here. So we'll do that when Fiat gets back. You apply pressure on it? Okay. That's great, Scott. Ooh. But you can see how fast it can go if you yeah. just slow down in your process. So every little step matters, right? So now he's starting to move the plunger. Okay. And that, oh wow, that's oh. a big deal. <laughs> yeah. I see how, that, that's going to happen. Yeah. See how fast it can go. Very big oh. deal. <laughs> and now he's also trying to give the juice after. See how he pressed the plunger first and gave the juice after? Oh, okay. So, not, at the, same. not at the same time. Yeah, it's a big deal. So kind of, so that's more teaching the orangutan. This is what needs to happen in order to get juice instead of just distracting the juice. Mm -hmm. This is like what we were talking about with the nebulizer too. All 
right. And like I said, the next session, we added a dull needle to that. And again, continue with really good progress on that. Okay, so now, where do we go? Now let's talk about advances on the horizon. So all that that I shared, I hope, um, I hope that's inspiring, because that was all really good stuff. But I, but I think we get to do even more cool stuff, which I think is really amazing. So I'm going to just kind of list some things here, and we'll talk about these a little bit. I'd like, to, I'd like to say that this is really just an introduction, and I think a really good place to, um, to, to go and get some more information, and I'll also have some resources for you at the end, um, is one thing I would suggest is to go back and listen to the talk by um, Dr. Joe Lang at last year or I guess it's this year's conference, right? Not last year's. This year's conference, um, your keynote, man, um, that's that's a really great presentation um, that is really in line with some of the things that I am touching on here. Um, I guess what I'm doing is I'm maybe perhaps giving you some more video examples to support some of the things that he was saying because um, – uh, his information and um, the information he's been sharing from Dr. Uh, um, Israel Goldime, and these are all, all you know, things that have been very influential for me. So I really highly recommend those resources to you. Uh, so I want to touch base on things like better tools to achieve goals with nonlinear contingency analysis. I know these are big words, but hopefully the video clips will help a little bit. Um, degrees of freedom, bringing new understanding to ascent the importance of using functional reinforcers. Man, really, really helpful to me. Um, beneficial applications of negative reinforcement procedures and identifying conditions under which positive reinforcement can be coercive. So I think um, all of these are, are um, just the start. There's a whole lot more than this, but I think these are just some good places to really touch base. And like I said, um, I, I definitely recommend going back and listening to um, Dr. Joe Lang's presentation from the conference if you um, have access to that. I think it's at animalprofessional.com. Okay, so let's get into this a little bit. What is nonlinear contingency analysis? So I think one of the things that is um, maybe a little bit new for people is, is understanding that there's many contingencies that impact behavior. We have a tendency to focus on just the ABCs or maybe just seeing positive reinforcement. And maybe that's because we have a long history of being um, instructed to use positive reinforcement, which is often contrived, um, to impact behaviors. But there's also a lot of behaviors that are maintained by negative reinforcement that we, we sometimes just don't see. And a lot of times we are working with groups of animals. And so the behavior of our target animal is impacted by all these other animals as well. And um, I, not too long ago, I did a presentation for the Constructional Approach to Animal Welfare and Training, um, which is um, caawt.com. I did a presentation on training herds. And oh my gosh, there's so much nonlinear contingency analysis going on there. <laughs> Um, if you get a chance to visit their site, you'll, you can check out that presentation. I think it's, it's still available um, for a little while longer. Um, and the environment is also impacting the behavior. And so that's another contingency. So if an animal is hesitant to go into a shoot, that is indicating, a, you know, escape and avoidance behavior, another negative reinforcement contingency. Maybe it doesn't want to go into a tunnel. Um, hot wire, you know, that's another contingency. Slippery surfaces, another contingency. All those things are contingencies that are impacting behavior. And um, further investigation can reveal um, relevant prior learning history. So that's another contingency. And, um, and of course, we've talked a little bit about the natural history of the, of the species, so the ethology and the phylogeny. So all of those are impacting behavior at the same time. So, so when we focus only on one, we're not really getting the whole picture as to why an animal will or will not do a behavior or is participating um, in doing a certain behavior that maybe is one that you want them to do or not or don't want them to do. So I just I'm going to share this one little video clip for now. Um, but uh, um, who knows, I'm kind of thinking about uh, of, of uh, submitting this as an abstract for the conference. We'll see. <laughs> but I want to share um, this video clip. Oh, my slide looks a little different than I anticipated. Okay, anyway, um, so let me uh, 
talk about what's going on here. So this is a, a gold mine tamarind that's being trained to go into a crate. But what you will notice is that this animal is not comfortable with the door being closed. So that immediately tells you something. That tells you there's a contingency, a negative reinforcement contingency. The door closing is an aversive event. And that is something the animal would like removed. So that tells you it's negative reinforcement. So if the animal walks towards the door and the door opens, then walking towards the door would get negatively reinforced. And so that could increase the behavior of walking towards the door if the door opens. So what we want to do to address that negative reinforcement contingency is open the door when the animal does behavior we want, like staying inside the crate. So we're going to try and create that situation. We're going to create a condition in which this animal can be can successfully stay in the crate and we can open that door. We're also using a positive reinforcement contingency for her staying in the crate. You'll see the, the um, keeper is going to give her some food for staying in the crate. But if she stays in the crate and um, calmly, we're also going to open the door before before she walks to the door. That's how we're gonna address that negative reinforcement contingency. Now we've also got other contingencies too because there's these sake monkeys <laughs> that are hanging out here and that are doing stuff too. And some of their behavior around that crate may impact her behavior. It may increase her likelihood to leave the crate and decrease her likelihood to stay in the crate. So those are contingencies we have to look at as well. So let's play this and keep all that in mind as you're watching this training session, right? So if that sake monkey went in the crate, it could increase her likelihood to deep to leave the crate via a negative reinforcement contingency, right? So, um, so we have to. Okay, so here we go. Oh, I should turn up the volume a little bit here, so you can hear what he said. Well, I have lots of environmental distractions. Yeah, yeah, I can tell. Door. You're not paying attention. Reinforce her for coming back, yeah, for sure. Perfect. You didn't even leave. And you too. I know. They're pushy. This company, so clearly. Sorry, Oh, that's perfect. That was really good because she looked, but you know, got a little nervous, but you opened it before she bailed. Yeah. Door. Good. Great. And you see how like she realized. You could see her little brain thinking there. Nice. That was great. That was great. Good job. Oh, oh, I know. I think that was him. Yeah. Okay, come on. <laughs> got somebody in the way, huh? Four. Good. Yep. Oh. Really? You gonna come out here? Four. Good Great. Girl. Excellent. Excellent. Good timing. Really nice. That body language looked really good. So I hope you can see that there's so much more than positive reinforcement going on there. But I think one of the really important ones is the negative reinforcement contingency when the door is opening when she is giving us the behavior of staying in the crate. And I think what's even more important is that she's not just being distracted with food. She's actually looking at the door actively turning back to the keeper and that is when we're opening the door or trying to time that opening of the door so that what's being negatively reinforced is staying in the crate not 
moving towards the door. That's not the behavior we want to reinforce. We want to reinforce the behavior of staying in the crate by opening the door, removing that aversive event of the door closing. Okay, I hope that makes sense for you. But a um, lot more to e e explore on that topic because it's uh, it's such an important one, but, but we only have so much time here. All right, let's talk a little bit about degrees of freedom and behavioral freedom. So again, this is a big, deep topic, but I just want to touch on these things because they, um, they are really important. Um, so how many ways can the access animal, or <laughs> how many ways can the animal access desired outcomes? Usually in um, traditional animal training, there's only one option. So we would call that zero degrees of freedom, meaning that the animal can only get that thing that you're offering via one one way. But what we really want to aim for, if we can, is providing many different options to access that same desired outcome, because it gives you information. Because if the animal says, um, you know, I don't want to do what you're asking me to do, it might tell you that there's a negative reinforcement contingency. It might tell you that what you're asking it to do is not fun. And it's actually more fun to do this over here, because you know what, something aversive is happening over there. Nothing aversive is happening over here. So I'd rather do this than go over there. Like, you know, if you're asking an animal to, you know, contend with a door that might shut on it that it doesn't want to have shut on it. Um, and so what happens is, you know, when there aren't these degrees of freedom, the topography of the behavior can look conflicted. The animal's kind of going, oh, I'm hesitant. I want what you have to offer, but I'm a little bit afraid. So the animal wants that appetitive, but it shows hesitation or it might even show aggressive responses. So maybe, you know, the animal like bites at the hand to get the food, but it really doesn't want to deal with your scary hand if it doesn't like people. So when we increase those degrees of freedom, it gives us information to consider about why the animal does, does or does not want to participate in training. And what are those other contingencies that might be there? So, um, so these, that's why it's, it's important to increase those degrees of freedom if we can. So um, here's a good example of that. Um, this is a, a little uh, snowy egret and you're gonna see there's some fish in the water that it would love to get, get to. And, uh, but it's got to contend with some, some things to get to that fish. What are you going to do, buddy? Well, and they have to contend, they have to contend with alligators too. This is the conflict, the negative and positive reinforcement contingency. Totally. Oh, look at him, look. Yeah, that going here Oh. He's trying to find a new route now. Thinking, thinking. Yeah, and he's right. The gators are right over it. There's more coming down. Oh, I think they're over here. So it do, definitely buddy? tells you there's competing contingencies when you see that conflicted behavior. And so so what it can tell you to do is deal with the negative reinforcement contingency first. So um, so that's what I'm gonna try to show you here. So with my dog, um, he really loves fresh water. <laughs> fresh water is his favorite. And, um, and so when I, I have, um, uh, you can't see it, but behind the white pole, there are two water bowls. And whenever I would fill them up with the hose, as soon as I finished, he would run over and drink from those, those water bowls. He also has, there's also a dog door on my back door, so he can go into the, through the dog door anytime he wants, where there is also another bowl of water. And, um, and um, he does like to go drink from the toilet because also fresh water from the toilet, right? So, so in this very moment, there are three places where he can get water. But like I said, his preference, if he can get it, is from the hose because um, it's the freshest water. But he doesn't like being, he doesn't like the water when it's coming out of the hose. Being sprayed from the hose is scary. And uh, what I wanna show you is um, a baseline here where you're gonna see he walks away from the hose when I'm spraying it um, just because he doesn't like it. But the point is, he, do, he does have access to that water right now if he wants it. So he's got, um, so he'll have one, two, three, four. He'll have three degrees of freedom. If he wants water, he can get it. But the freshest water comes from the hose. But, um, but of course, right now, that's scary. So I want to address 
that that fear response by addressing the negative reinforcement contingency first. And that's what you'll see in this video clip here. But that's that's the information I, I'm, I get here. So I'm gonna spray it and he's like, oh, I'm out of here, don't like that. Here's another example, I'm gonna spray it. And he's like, no, nope, I'm out of here. Now he likes being around me, he likes my companionship. So when he approaches me, I scratch him, but I also turn off the hose. So I'm gonna to toss a treat to get him to go away from me. He comes back, give him a scratch. I'm not giving him treats for approaching me, but he likes my attention and my companionship. I could be creating a loop though by tossing the treat away, making a little chain there. But every time he approaches, I also turn off the hose, but I'm gradually raising criteria, like leaving the hose on a little bit longer before I turn it off. So that, but that is a negative reinforcement contingency. I'm removing the aversive. And eventually what happens, I can leave it on longer, and he goes, oh, the fresh water? Kind of like that. <laughs> and I also add some positive reinforcement for interacting with it. And now when I fill up the water bowl, He comes right over and drinks. And to this day, as soon as I'm filling up a water bowl with the hose, he comes over and drinks. So I took care of the negative reinforcement contingency and now, and now we don't have that conflicted behavior anymore. All right, so let's talk about functional reinforcers. So this is what is the desired outcome the animal is seeking by engaging them in the behavior. And so when you saw in that previous video, when my animal was going away, he wanted distance. He wanted distance as a reinforcer. He doesn't, he doesn't want to be near the water. You know, giving him food for coming up to the hose isn't what he wants. He wants the water to go, or the hose to go away. No, I shouldn't say the water, but the spray, but it being sprayed from the, from the hose is, is the, is distance from that is the functional reinforcer. So if we identify functional reinforcers, reinforcers, we can help avoid delays to appropriate interventions and potentially continued reinforcement of undesired responses. So what's often overlooked in animal training industry is the desired outcome of distance from a stimulus. And that could be distance from a person, it could be distance from an object, distance from a place, you know, sometimes the place is, is you know, stuck, like if it's a chute that's been installed, you can't remove the chute, but you can move the animal away from the chute. Um, it might be a smell, like the smell of antiseptics. Um, it might be a sound. Um, so there's there's a lot of things that we we tend to don't realize are the aversive stimulus that the animal just wants to get away from it. And so they might be using fear responses, escape, avoidance, or aggressive behavior to let you know that they want distance from that aversive stimulus. So um, I thought I'd share this example with you. This is a binturong that um, is an animal ambassador. And uh, you're going to see sort of the before, you'll see the, a little bit of the before, you'll see the process, and then the after. And this is where we are going to use distance as a reinforcer. And when we do that, the idea is that you're, and again, this is a negative reinforcement contingency. We're removing an aversive stimulus, but what we're gonna do is we're go going to do it under conditions in which the animal can be successful. So we have to start far enough away that the animal can give you a desired response that you can reinforce by removing that aversive stimulus. And so that's what you're gonna see in this video. In the beginning, you're gonna see the undesired responses that lets us know this animal wants distance as a reinforcer. And then you're gonna see how we set up the environment so that, so that she can emit responses that are reinforceable. And then how, what it looks like afterwards where we transition, now that we've taken care of that negative reinforcement contingency, now we can transition to positive reinforcement and she's receptive because you took care of the negative reinforcement contingency. Coffee. Back that thing up and try and get started. Okay. Back up.
So she didn't want food, right? So, okay. Yeah, so the so amount of jumping thing when it looks like all four paws on the ground but that's, of the crate. That's coming to be mean, right? Um, okay. she's in it. Yeah, she's a little bit interested and she's also being yeah. So like, even if Becca or Travis weren't there or something, she comes in and she kind of pops up. Yeah. I said like 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 that calm response right there. <laughs> that look on her face was sort of like, hmm, this is interesting. Now for me, you could really see her thinking there. Yeah, she was for sure. <laughs> She's like, what is going on here? <laughs> Perfect, that's great to walk away on. Perfect. Because she just went chill and relaxed, didn't like, she? I'm just gonna sit now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's like, hmm, I don't really have to get grumpy to make this guy go away, do I? So you gonna lay all the way down? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, this is puzzling. It's not irritating me very much. <laughs> She's just sitting. She's just like sitting, like, oh, okay. <laughs> So one thing you could try then, because she's so relaxed, you could actually just, oh, she lifted up. You, you, could, you could approach and just walk away while she's laying down. You don't have to wait for her to do anything. Just to be like, you're relaxed, that's great. And I'll come up and I'll go away while you're relaxed. You don't have to wait for her to do anything, but just be relaxed and I'll go away. Yep. To teach her that she doesn't have to be grumpy to get you to go away. Oh, she even settled in a little bit more. And so this was on my next visit, and um, we gave transition to positive reinforcement. Good. Oh, that's a good one. That was so good. So, so, uh, yeah. So, so again, you know, you take care of that negative reinforcement contingency of the animal wanting distance, they learn that they don't need to use the aggressive behavior or escape and avoidance behavior to get what they what they um, would like. And then you're able to move on, you're able to move on to the positive reinforcement strategies again. All right, so um, another thing that has been really important is understanding what counter conditioning looks like. I think um, we've had some confusion about what um, what counter conditioning is and what trainers are doing procedurally. So this nonlinear contingency analysis really helps with 
uh, helping us get some clarity on that. And again, it helps us identify these functional reinforcers and comp uh, compliance becomes more reinforcement based, which is really more in line with what we're, we're doing, to, to be honest. So just to kind of help explain a little bit about what counter conditioning really is, it does involve pairing a stimulus with a stimulus. Um, in our case, we're usually trying to address a situation when it, where an animal you know, has responded to an aversive stimulus. And so we, we are typically trying to pair a stimulus that is considered aversive with, an, with a stimulus that an animal might consider repetitive. Generally, we try to use food. Um, but what's really, really important is this temporal relation of the stimulus-stimulus pairing. So what that means is that the animal needs to contact both stimuli at the exact same time. Not that they're presented at the same time. It actually needs to contact these stimuli at the same time. So that means that the animal would need to eat the food at the exact same time that this aversive stimulus is present and that it's really aware of, you know, both of these things at the same time. It really matters. So, um, and, uh, and, and by definition, the observed behavioral response of the animal doesn't dictate um, the stimulus, uh, this, when the stimulus, stimulus pairing and contact occurs. So meaning that we're, you know, we don't necessarily have criteria for what the animal is doing when it makes contact with um, with these two things. But and and also how it might be working, what they think is that it's just an extinction of the fear and aggressive response in the presence of of um, or of that aversive stimulus, and that maybe the appetitive is sort of helping that along. And one of the things with extinction is that you know it isn't necessarily a a pleasant process always. So, so um, you know, extinction can be frustrating a little bit. So I wanted to give you an example and kind of, kind of think about this. So an example that I've heard presented before, and I think this will really kind of help you understand that it's really kind of about contingencies and you see my slides a little messed up here, but we'll go with, go <laughs> with it anyway. So let's say you have a bird like a vulture over here in an enclosure and we've got a food bowl um, inside the enclosure and we're going to have a person walk by and drop food in the bowl and we, and we don't really care what the vulture is doing. So this has been presented as a counter conditioning procedure, but I want to help you understand how this is really more about contingencies than it is about counter conditioning. So if we think about the human being, and I'm just going to put all these up here for now. Okay. So if you think about it, this person comes by, drops food in the bowl and walks away. We don't know what this bird is doing. And then, and typically what happens is at some point the bird is going to come up and eat this food. But typically what, what doesn't happen is that the person and the food and the bird all are contacting everything at the same time. So this bird is not going to contact the food and the aversive stimulus at the same time. That would be counter conditioning as by definition, right? What typically happens is this person walks by drops the food, walks away, and then at some point this animal is going to come over and eat the food. So, so what really happens is, is um, an aversive stimulus is presented and goes away. And whatever this bird is doing at that moment gets negatively reinforced by the aversive stimulus coming and going away. So that gets negatively reinforced. And then there's a piece of food left over here. This, the person is long gone and the bird may come over whenever it does and eat that food item. And so whatever, you know, that bird does then gets, re gets positively reinforced. So what's really happening here is two, um, two different behaviors that get negatively reinforced and positively reinforced. So we're really just talking about um, two contingencies. And so with that information, now what we can do is kind of like what you saw with um, the binturong is we can say, okay, I've got two contingencies. Now I can carefully apply these and, and use them to help shape the behavior that I want. If, if that animal, you know, is having, showing a fear response to that, that person. So that's one thing we can think about. Another um, counter conditioning scenario that we sometimes see described is like, say we've got um, an animal that 
ha uh, sees an object as an aversive stimulus and we want to introduce that object. So, and I've done this and I'm going to show you a video of this. And the object is slowly presented and the food is presented as well. Maybe the food is presented first and then the, then the object is slowly presented at the same time. And so as long as the animal remains comfortable and relaxed, then we keep introducing that object while the animal's eating, eating the food. And so again, if we were to look at our definition of counter conditioning, it doesn't quite fit the definition because um, the behavior of the animal really matters in this, right? So we're kind of having this criteria that as long as the animal's relaxed and calm, we're gonna we're gonna keep introducing this aversive stimulus. And we're also, you know, kind of delivering the food contingent on the animal staying relaxed and calm. So again, that kind of brings us into this place of it's a shaping procedure. We're reinforcing calm body language as we slowly introduce this object. And so I kind of see that slow introduction of the object as a stimulus fading procedure, and we're just reinforcing this calm um, body language or stationing behavior as we're bringing in this, this object, this stimulus fading. So again, it's not really counter conditioning where you don't care what the animal's doing and the, and the appetitive and the aversive are being introduced at the same time and it's sort of relying on extinction. It's, it's really more of a shaping procedure. So we have some, some confusion, I think, in our, our community. So, so if we were to acknowledge that what we're really doing is, is shaping procedures and their contingencies, then that allows us to kind of rethink our tools and maybe do some better application there. So again, I'm going to kind of show you some videos. So here's me using sort of that last thing I just described and and you know I get success but maybe I could do better. So here is a cockatoo that I I have a syringe in my left hand and I'm trying to get this cockatoo to touch the tip of the syringe with his beak and and here is that conflicted body language that I've been sharing with you. You can see the bird wants the appetitives and even though it can leave like it just did it wants what I have to offer, so it's struggling. It's a, it's, it's wants this appetitive, but the body language says, "Ugh!" But I have to put up with the scary stuff in order to get it. So it's got those competing contingencies, right? There's a negative reinforcement contingency in which it wants to escape and avoid something aversive, but at the same time, it wants the the treats that I have. Also, because there's no degrees of freedom, it's the only way to get those treats. So even though I get behavior. Maybe I could do something a little bit better here, knowing that I've got these competing contingencies and no degrees of freedom. So there, so I got success, but like I said, could I do better? So let's take a look at another example. So in this example, I'm working with my blue-throated macaw, and I'm, I'm going to ask her to touch an object as well, and I wanted to show that it's scary for her. So this is my baseline. I'm holding up an object she's never seen before, and, and you can see she kind of leans back when I bring it towards her. So this time I remove it and you can see she moves forward when I move it away. So I'm going to focus first just on trying to negatively reinforce things that I like. Anytime she moves towards it or her head turns in that direction, I'm just going to move the target away. And, I'm, and you'll see at this stage I'm not using any food or anything. I'm just negatively reinforcing any any movements, any head movements, any looks in the direction I like. Um, and I'm trying not to bring it so close to her that she might lean away from it. And a lot of it is just trying to set, set it up so that she can 
feel comfortable. And so at that time when she reached for it, I pulled it away, but I also gave her uh, a preferred food item. So now I'm using kind of a combination of both, but I tried to take care of the negative reinforcement contingency first so that it would make it more likely that I could use switch over to the positive reinforcement contingency as well. And so now it's kind of, so now it's kind of a combination of both. But by first addressing the negative reinforcement contingency, it was a lot easier for her to feel comfortable, I would say, <laughs> if I'm jumping into my bird's head there, to start reaching for that target. And, and literally that, that whole thing took about five minutes to get to that point where she was proactively reaching for the target. And walking, toward, and walking towards it, as you can see there. So just to kind of let you see that difference in body language. Wow. You know, so that was kind of that snatch and go. I want, you know, I'll take that treat, but I really don't want to be here. So it's a, it's a different, different perspective, right? And um, some of you may have recalled that I shared this in 2021 uh, with the Sumatran tiger. So the constructional aggression treatment, which again, this was a tiger that you'll see sort of the before body language. They were asking the animal to target, but I think the aversive stimulus was people. And so we did um, some removing of people first to address that negative reinforcement contingency. And then once we did that, we, we saw a much different response. So you'll just see the before and after here. So even though the animal would target, the body language is very different in the beginning of this video compared to afterwards. And, you know, this is about 20 minutes later after we address the negative reinforcement contingency. And you can see that uh, entire presentation from the 2021 ABMA conference and also in my virtual education program. So, so to me, we're, we're really at the beginning of a new era. We've learned a lot, especially as practitioners, because we just, we train all the time. However, we're at the cusp of an exciting new era in animal training. We have the potential to substantially maximize benefits and minimize harms for our learners. It's 
for me, <laughs> it's time to usher in the next wave of evidence-based information to enhance our ability to improve animal welfare. And I just think we are so lucky to be a part of this significant moment in history. And so I would really like to express my gratitude to the following people for generously sharing their expertise because it has helped my training tremendously. Um, TV Joe Lang, Dr. Jesus Rosales Ruiz, Dr. Paul Andranis, Sean Will, and Masanishi Muta of the Constructional Approach to Animal Welfare and Training, Dr. Parveen Farhudi and Eddie Fernandez, they've all really um, helped me learn a lot about the constructional approach to animal welfare and training. And, um, and uh, yeah, so I encourage you to check out their material and their teachings as well. And uh, I also would like you to check out some of these relevant resources that will continue your journey and learning more about this information. And I also would like to let you know that you are welcome to stay in touch with me. These are some of the places where you can find me. I do a live stream Mondays at 11, most every Monday, not every Monday. Um, I also have a newsletter that you're welcome to join in that um, way. I will try to send you an update every Monday on what my live stream will be about and also other um, events and resources that I have for you um, at animaltrainingfundamentals.com, which is my virtual education program. Um, we are talking uh, all sorts of science stuff, so as well as practical application of training, and um, I hope you can join me there. And again, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you. Um, it's really exciting, um, all the cool things that are happening in animal training right now, and uh, I hope this information will be helpful to you. So thank you again. And if you'd like to keep the learning going, I'd love to invite you to join AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com. It is a virtual learning program designed for professionals and aspiring professionals interested in improving animal welfare using evidence-based training technology. It's especially targeted for those working with exotic animals in managed care. And the virtual learning program features award-winning courses, tracks to guide professional development, verifiable badges to share, improve course completion, community, and much more. There is a continually growing library of content, and there is a special 15% discount for people who have viewed this presentation. You can use the code ABMABEHMO22, and this will expire January 31st, 2023, so I do recommend taking advantage of it now. It's valid for any of our membership options. We have a annual, a monthly, and we also have a facility option that will allow you to have up to 200 sub accounts. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation and you can take advantage of our special discount for those of you who have enjoyed this presentation. Thank you again.